Donc, euh, euh, j'invite maintenant euh, M. Sébastien Rolos. Je m'excuse, Sébastien, du, du retard. <rire> Mais Sébastien, il est professeur adjoint de philosophie à l'Université du Ljubljana, en Slovénie. Et il va, euh, sa conférence a pour titre, on a un nouveau titre, « Neither beast or angel, the reflective science, scientist in the life mind problem ». Uh, the floor is yours, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely, uh, lovely conference. Um, as you might have noticed, I have changed the title of the of the presentation, so it's it's a bit different now. Um, also, what I would like to say is um, that there is a bit of a, a Monty Python, and now let's move to something completely different. Uh, touch to this presentation because I will talk touch upon some of the topics uh, from a slightly different slant. And uh, also uh, the things that I will be presenting are work in progress, so they might be a bit rough around the edges, and I apologize for that. Maybe we can go into the uh, into these uh, more uh, unclear parts in the discussion. So by way of introduction, I would like to start off my presentation with a quote from a paper called An Address on the Relation of Physiology to Physics and Chemistry that was published uh, at the beginning of the previous century by the famous uh, British biologist G.A.S. Haldane. In this paper, Haldane basically uh, presents a spirited defense of the organicist slash anti-reductionist conception of life, and he ends the paper uh, with the following words that a meeting point between biology, and I uh, suggest that for the purposes of our uh, presentation, we switch this with life sciences, which include neuroscience and cognitive science. So the meeting point between biology and physical science may at some time be found, there is no reason for doubting. But we may confidently predict that if that meeting point is found and one of the two sciences is swallowed up, that one will not be biology or life sciences. Now, on the su superficial reading of this particular quote, my, one might think, uh, isn't this a bit unnecessarily daring, perhaps even naive, uh, taking on physics, which is known to be the queen of sciences like that, uh, especially given the fact that biology and uh, life sciences in general have basically um, already started to adopt heavily the, the, the approaches, principles and methods of physical science into themselves at this point. Well, I would say daring indeed it is. It has a bit of a David versus Goliath vibe to it, um, but naive, hardly. Um, already uh, uh, at the beginning, so um, in the early 20th century, uh, we all know that uh, these were um, the beginnings of pretty turbulent times for uh, physics, which ended in a full-blown uh, crisis in the 20s and 30s. And in retrospect, of course, this all seems as if this was a natural development of the physical sciences. But back then, it was way more murky, way more unsecure, way more obscure. And also, during those times, uh, mechanical or mechanicist approaches in biology had uh, a lot of difficulties because there were a lot of alternative approaches um, around uh, approaches of uh, organicist and vitalist bent. Um, but not only, so not only was the, um, um, uh, this particular statement not naive in my opinion, but it was in fact quite prescient. Um, namely, what we can see happening in the past few decades, something that probably started already in the 60s and the 70s, but it um, is definitely uh, clear or becoming more and more clear, clear now is the unprecedented rise uh, of life sciences. So um, it would seem that the wind has been taken out of the sails of particle physics, of cosmology and theoretical physics. Um, there's been talk of uh, uh, a new crisis. Um, there was a lot of talk about stagnancy, of sterility, of work in those particular fields. No new uh, particularly interesting work has been done for the past couple of decades. Whereas in the life sciences, things are extremely, extremely vibrant. Um, so um, a lot of empirical and theoretical happening is going on, and there's been also a lot of social, cultural, and economic prestige related to that. And we, as we know, this is what 
uh, uh, makes or breaks a given discipline. And as I said in the introductory talk, there are many uh, different poles of domination in cognitive science. Well, this holds true for natural sciences in general, and it would seem that this uh, distribution of power is shifting on many different levels towards the natural sciences. Okay, but what could be these meet, this meeting point or meeting points if there are more about which Haldane speaks? And why is, he, uh, is Haldane so confident that life sciences weren't going to be the one that will be swallowed, but that it will be the physics that will be swallowed if any of the two got, uh, gets swallowed? Well, the first and more obvious uh, answer to this, so the meeting point that might be a challenge for physics or physicalist approaches is the nature and life, uh, nature of life and organism. Um, if in the second half of the 20th century, questions about life and organism, as Dan Nicholson in his studies so nicely portrays, were basically non-existent, they were treated almost as pseudo question, something that has been solved for good. As of late, concepts such as autonomy, organization, plasticity, rhythm, and so on and so, uh, so, on and so forth, have definitely helped to revitalize, pun intended, uh, these questions. Uh, and we could say that there are ana analogous developments in mind sciences as well, with regards to mind itself and consciousness. Uh, and I've prepared a collage of different titles from various papers that kind of attest to this. Uh, we have a call for new biology for a new century, a welcome return of the organism, uh, talk of the post-genomic era, and uh, my all-time favorite, the organism is dead, long live the organism. Um, so in a certain sense, and with a lot of uh, qualifications and a lot of caution, we might say that we are witnessing in a certain sense a move from life uh, being construed in suborganismic, that is to say mechanistic uh, terms, where life sciences are basically considered to be satellites of uh, the uh, physics in the grand scheme of things, towards the conception of life in organismic that is to say, uh, uh, in organismic terms, that is to say, in terms of self-organizing wholes. Uh, and here, life sciences are conceived as autonomous. However, and this is basically the crucial point about my talk, I would argue that in addition to the question about nature of, of life and organisms, there is yet another meeting point, a yet another challenge that is far more, uh, that is more far reaching and more radical than the one that I've just presented. So the, uh, the one about the nature of life and organism. And this other meeting point has to do with the implications uh, that the introduction of autonomous living wholes has on our notions of knowledge, on science, on reality, and so on and so forth. So, in other words, um, the reason why the more physicalistically and or naturalistically minded thinkers might object to the introduction of, say, living wholes or different holist or organistic, organicist notions may not be so much related to the ideas of wholeness themselves, but to the fact that they threaten to open up a Pandora's box of unpleasant epistemological and metaphysical questions that many people would like to keep closed. So, and it is this meeting, uh, this meeting point, uh, or at least a certain segment of it, that I would like to focus in this talk. And this is the meeting point that I refer to by the name of reflexive scientist, okay? A problem of reflexive scientist. So, in order to introduce this problem, the problem of reflexive scientist, let me start off by a point that was made by French philosopher Renaud Barbara, I apologize to all the French speakers for this dreadful pronunciation, about the two meanings that, are, uh, that can be attributed to the French verb vivre. Uh, the latter can mean both uh, to live and to experience. And a similar um, duality can be found in German Leben and Erleben, or in Slovene, uh, Živeti and Doživeti. So you have a, 
a, a similar word, so the same word or a similar word that ascribes two different points, two different things. So this notion vivre can relate to both living beings, that is to say organisms, that is to say existences in the world, but it can also re relate and refer to lived experience, so to the felt aliveness, that is to say existence or giveness or presence of the world. So existences in the world and existence of the world in a certain sense as a lived presence. And the same ambiguity, says uh, Georges Canguilhem, Canguilhem uh, can be found in the phrase knowing life, okay? Because knowing life can mean on the one hand, knowledge of life, that is to say, scientists studies uh, organisms that are coping with their environments. And here, life features as an object uh, uh, of knowledge. But on the other hand, Knowing life can also refer to life of knowledge. That is to say, in studying the organisms that are coping with their environment, the scientist him or herself is an organism or a living being coping with his or her environment. So life is not only an object here, an object of inquiry or study, but also, and perhaps even more importantly or fundamentally, a vehicle of knowledge. It is, we could say, that from which knowledge issues forth, and in this particular case, in the case of biologists, ultimately returns, okay? So we have the scientist who is both a thinking, thinking being, inquiring into what organisms are, and here we are dealing with life as thought, so life as an object of thought, like life that, as something that is being thought, and also, scientist is also a living being, a being that lives what it thinks, or a being that lives what he or she thinks. So he, here we have life as lived. And now we see why this second meeting point, why the second challenge is more radical and more far-reaching. Far and I would like to illustrate this with a nice quote from Canguilhem, where he talks about two empires. He says the following. The classical vitalist accepts the insertion of the living organism into a physical milieu to whose law, laws it constitutes an exception. A classical vitalist is someone who would say that there is something unique about the living beings, and he, tries, he or she tries to explain this by positing new forces of some sort. That's a very simplified account and a very unfair account to a certain degree, but that would be a classical vitalist. Now, for Conguilhem, this is a problem. This is something that no philosopher should endorse. He says the following, therein lies, in our opinion, the philosophically inexcusable fault. So if you do this, you do, you're doing it wrong, okay? You're at fault. There cannot be an empire within an empire without there being no longer any empire. So if you try to posit an additional empire into the empire of science, you're basically end up with no empire whatsoever. You basically dissolve the empire. But now comes the important point. If one is to assert the originality of the biological, this must be in terms of the originality of one realm over the whole experience and not over the islets of experience. So if life is the vehicle of knowledge, this means that it permeates my whole experience and also my whole cognitive life. So this is what it means to assert the originality of biological. In the end, the classical vitalism sins paradoxically only in its excessive modesty in its reluctance to universalize the conception of experience. So once we do what we just did, life is no longer there to be picked like a ripe fruit, okay? It's not out there where you can simply pick it like a ripe fruit, but it is what in one way or another allows the fruit or tree of knowledge to grow. So this is the problem of the, say, reflexive scientists. And this is the second meeting point that is, in my opinion, more problematic than the first one that I mentioned. 
Now, the theme or the trope of reflexive scientist is common in early and activist literature, as you probably all know. One finds it, say, in the, um, uh, the Tree of Knowledge by Maturana and Varela, where, where the whole book is structured in this particular way. So you're questioning about what, it, what is life, and then you go through the whole process of autopoiesis that brings forth its own world. And then the scientist, him, him or herself, is also a living being, and you have a circular structure of the book. And the same, uh, um, the same trope or the same theme is brought up in the embodied mind way where the authors explicitly talk about the reflective scientist who reflects on what he is doing and so on and so forth. But in general, I would say that in this literature, the question or the problem is po posited, but then it is kind of left hanging. It is not really responded to. It is not really replied or developed. Um, however, uh, similar questions were almost bread and butter <laughs> in the philosophical uh, uh, discussions in the in the German and the French uh, um, uh, uh, philosophy and science uh, towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And in some of the things that I will be developing later on, I will draw heavily on the works on uh, authors such as Conguilhem, Merleau-Ponty, and Plesner to try to address this particular question. Now, Conguilhem mentions two extreme views or two extreme responses to this particular question. Yeah? So one is what he calls, and I love, love the way he love the way Conguilhem phrases things, crystalline intellectualism. He says this is where knowledge is destroyed by life. Okay, we might say that this approach is some sort of a fetishization of thought. You basically propound some version of a universalism, objectivism, a determinative, clear and uh, distinct way of thinking, whereby all the murky, ambiguous, uh, obscure things that are somehow related to uh, of, um, vitality need to be dispelled, need to be cast out. But on the other hand, you have foggy mysticism, as Conguilhem calls it. So this is uh, a derision of knowledge by life. And this we might call would be a fetishization of lived experience. So here, what you end up with is some sort of a Lebensphilosophische relativism, exper experientialism, emphasis on the ineffable lived experience. Now, a similar position could be found in the post varelian tradition, so in the inactivist uh, literature in general. On the one hand, you have people who simply ignore what I've just been saying, so they don't really care about what I was saying, and they were just they just try to kind of uh, um, um, okay. Um, apparently, my screen was not visible, um, um, so they just try to embed the notion of inaction in, say, the objectivist slash naturalist framework of sorts, and they don't really care much about the things I've just mentioned. So life is just an object of knowledge that's, that is inserted into the, this framework or scheme, and that's basically it. But there are also positions that slide into the experientialist or some sort of constructivist uh, position in, in a radical sense, uh, and this would be the defense of the elusiveness, ineffability of lived experience. And I have to admit that I myself was guilty of the latter in some of my uh, works, but have since grown dissatisfied with this particular solution to the problem. So what I would try to do now is I will um, try to do the following. I will try to develop uh, or um, mm, show how one can think about this described situation. So the, 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 the problem of the relationship between mind thought on the one hand and the life vitality on the other, without sliding into either what I would like to call, call the extreme of angelic intellection and the other extreme of brutish sensation on the other. And this is also where you can see where I took the, the, the title of my presentation from. It is from Pascal, from his thoughts, where he says, man is neither angel nor beast, and unhappily whoever wants to act the angel acts the beast. So basically my question will be how we can find a middle point between two two extremes, so a very Varelian endeavor, a very Varelian approach, via media again, in a conceptually coherent way, 
And I will do so by the authors I've already mentioned. So by Conguilhem, Merleau-Ponty, Plesner, and also Varela. So let us start by um, describing what I would like to call the dynamics of life. And here I would like to bring forth two characteristics of life that I find interesting. And by the way, I'm kind of, um, the things that I'm developing here assume or take it for granted the more, say, uh, autonomous, holistic conception of life. This is not something that I'm trying to argue for. It is my starting point, okay? So, of course, somebody might at the very get-go say, well, you know, you haven't really proven this. This is not the intention of this talk. We can maybe touch upon this in the discussion. So, uh, polarity and radiation. Uh, these, again, are terms taken from Canguilhem. What does that mean? Life is dynamic polarity, says Canguilhem. And he says that this means the following. The fundamental fact is that life is not indifferent to the conditions in which it is possible, that life is polarity and thereby even an unconscious position of value. In short, life is a normative activity. Let me try to unpack just a little bit, uh, this just a little bit. So, Life is dynamic or autonomous unity. We've already talked about this, and I also addressed this in uh, the introductory talk. So living forms are forms becoming. There is an ongoing uh, circular, circular process. We talked about this, and uh, Professor Fuchs, Fuchs uh, touched upon this notion in his marvelous talk. So between the physiological processes on the one hand and the biological whole on the other. So we have this processuality, this cir circularity, which ends up with this uh, new gestalt of an autonomous uh, living unity. Then this unity, dynamic autonomous unity, is, according to Conguiem, uh, uh, a virtual or a normative center. That is to say, it determines the conditions of possibility for its self-maintenance and self-actuality. Plesner says that every living being posits a boundary. It owns its boundary. The boundary is not just an in-between between two, uh, two items that equally uh, uh, are somehow, um, uh, that equally have it, that equally own, possess it somehow, but the living being posits and owns its boundary, and by doing so, it determines the conditions of possibility, as I've said, of self-maintenance and self-actualization. Um, what this means is basically that the engagements with matter, interactions with matter, matter to the organism. They matter to the organism. That is why the, the living being does not react to certain physical chemical factors, external stimuli, but responds in lights of its vital norms to those factors that are significant for its self-maintenance and self-actualization. And the final point with regards to polarity, living, this is why the, live, the notion of living body is introduced, whereby living body is not meant as an agglomerate or um, a mosaic of juxtaposed anatomical parts, but a virtual normative center, a vehicle of behavior and so on and so forth. Uh, in short, it is a biological living whole. Now, the second aspect is radiation. <laughs> to live is to radiate, which sounds a bit awkward uh, at, the, at the superficial level. So, uh, Conguillem explains this as follows. It is characteristic of the living that it makes its milieu for itself. It is to organize the milieu from and around a center of reference, which cannot itself be referred to without losing its original meaning. So, as I've already said, um, the organism is... Um, um, so, the organism um, does not react to specific discrete individual physical chemical stimuli, but instead responds to specific structures, configurations, gestalten, that are significant to this particular organism. So um, these are the structures or gestalten that could be called affordances, solicitations, and so on and so forth, which bring forth, solicit, afford a specific response, a certain attitude, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the organism brings forth its domain of signification, this is normally referred to by the term Umwelt, so it brings forth a certain virtual milieu, which is the dom domain of uh, significant 
engagements a significant anchorages for this particular organism. It is the domain of specific and relevant poles of attraction and resistance. Now there is a very close relationship between organism and milieu, between organism and umwelt. I said that life is polarization. So this polarization strives towards resolution, but in such a way that it reaffirms polarization. So life must not attain this particular resolution because this means death. So for this reason, it has a very special relationship with its milieu, namely organism to be separate from the milieu must be related to it. But on the other hand, to be related with the milieu and not simply engulfed or absorbed or dissolved in the milieu, it has to be separate from the milieu. So we have this strange relationship that Bortoft calls differencing relating and Plesner refers to as separating joining. And in Varela, we hide, find the idea of uh, operational closure and ther thermodynamic openness, basically two aspects of the same process. And for this reason, there is something in the Umwelt that is organism-like and something in the organism that is Umwelt or milieu-like. And Uxful expresses this very nicely when he talks about the interrelationship between the flower and the bee. He says, if the flower were not bee-like and the bee were not flower-like, the unison would not be successful. But then he goes even further and he says that in order for the eye to be able to see the sun, the eye has to be sun-like, but sun also has to be eye-like. These are very radical statements and can be interpreted in very different ways. Now, one way, of course, to describe this notion of, um, of Umwelt and all of this would be with the example of sucrose, but I'm not going to do this because one has uh, rarely the opportunity to use a much more juicy example introduced in the normal and the pathological by Kanguiem. He says the following, but to fail to admit that from a biological point of view, life differentiates between its states means condemning oneself to be even unable to distinguish food from excrement. So what distinguishes food from excrement is not physical chemical reality, but a biological value. So if we summarize dynamics, what I call here dynamics of life, we see that life is always positioned or situated. It does not merely occupy space, but as Plesner puts it, it owns it. It is anchored in it. It embodies a perspective. So that is the first uh, takeaway message, the perspe perspective. And the second is that what matters for the living beings is not matter, but relations. So organisms respond, as we have seen, seen to the significant relations and not to individual, individual physical chemical factors, but to factors that are significant, valuable to it in a specific context and in, with, within a specific behavioral pattern. And it does so through its positioning in and through the, the relation between the virtual center and its umwelt. So the, the relations of specific stimuli in, in, are important and they acquire their rela uh, significance in the context of the relation between the organism and its umwelt. And these two aspects are important because when I will shift to the uh, dynamics of mind, I will start with them. So perspective and relations, okay, keep that in mind. Now the question pops up immediately. Scientist is alive, okay, a living being. So these characteristics of polarity and radiation also hold true for scientists, st scientists him or herself. So could we then just say that scientific world is simply another Umwelt? Uh, which would mean that, you know, it is in a certain sense relative, it is in a certain sense uh, reducible to the lived, uh, the, to the life world and so on and so forth. Well, I would respond yes and no, and let me elaborate on that, okay? In the past, I might say yes, now I am leaning way more towards the no, but yes and no is the correct answer. Why yes? Let's start with the yes part, okay? Um, so the the huh, I have the uh, name here. So um, th this part I would like to uh, um, um, illuminate through the through the notion that I've been toying around with lately, which is technognosis. What what does this mean? Well, um, 
In the past several decades, although this goes all the way back to the beginnings of the 20th century, several ethnographers, philosophers, and people in the realm of STS have emphasized the important, importance of the technical and technological in science. So the main point is that technology and technique are not simply handmaidens of knowledge in science, but are vehicles of knowledge so that technology and technique contribute to the scientific knowledge in the sense that they are constitutive of this knowledge. The usual picture have is, has it this way. You have science that develops certain theories and then you have technology as application. It turns out that the picture is way more complex and messy because often the technological action, the various techniques, the various objects that are being developed through these techniques, actually develop, uh, enable or, or open up the possibilities for the development of certain scientific theories. So it's not like you have a theory and then application, but very often it is from the, 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 the technical tinkering, as Varela would call it, that you get the emergence of certain model, mo models and theories. And given the fact that technology and techniques are extensions, extensions of embodied cognition, as Merleau-Ponty uh, uh, um, presents this nicely in phenomenology of perception, he says that, for example, various tools are uh, extensions of our bodily schema. And once you know and learn how to use a certain tool, it basically becomes incorporated into your bodily schema. So given the fact that these techniques and technologies are in, uh, extensions of embodied cognition, we might see that in knowledge, scientific knowledge, uh, implicit, practical, situated knowledge, uh, uh, what Merleau-Ponty calls knowledge in, knowledge in the hands or proctognosia, plays a significantly greater, greater role than it was traditionally or normally assumed. And given the fact that embodied mind, of course, is uh, refers to a living body, to this uh, living whole, then we see that life feeds into theory and knowledge. So vital action feeds into theory of knowledge. If embodied cognition is basically at the, at the foundation of technology and technique, and technology and technique are constitutive of theoretical knowledge, then we see that the structures of vitality feed into uh, scientific theories and scientific models, and that knowledge is, at least to a certain degree, as Conguiem would put it, in the service of life. But this is where yes goes to no, okay? So even if we say that knowledge is in a service of life, does this mean that knowledge is reducible to aliveness, to vitality? Well, the answer would be not necessarily. Why? Because if knowledge can be said to assist or extend life, it does so by engendering a qualitatively new form of life. It preserves life by transcending it. You can picture this in a similar way as you would a gestalt switch. So if you switch from one gestalt to the other, the material parts remain the same, but they are taken up in a different hole. Okay, so you haven't really moved somewhere else, but what you did was, what happened was it was eliminated. So knowledge eliminates life as a self-standing autonomous dynamic it's while simultaneously conserving and integ uh, integrating it into a new structure, a new whole. So mind and knowledge are basically a transformation of life in a literal sense, umgestaltung. You acquire a new gestalt, okay? Without becoming a disembodied spirit. So you have a restructuration, transformation without necessarily acquiring, without slipping into the realm of an angelic intellect, okay? So I will now try to kind of unpack this. But the main point before we proceed is the only way we can do this is, as Merleau-Ponty puts it, if there are several ways for the body to be a body. Okay, if there are several ways for the body to be a body, then you can have this transformation, restructuration without necessarily slipping into an angelic intellect. So already with technognosis, uh, what we see, what we saw was that human beings exhibit enormous variation in behavior and also the possibility for transformation of behavior. Okay, I will now read two quotes, one by Conguilhem, one by Merleau-Ponty on this topic. Uh, 
Coquilem says the following, man has succeeded in living in all climates, but above all, he is the animal who through technology succeeds in varying even the ambience of his activity on the spot, thereby showing himself to now as the only species capable of variation. And the quote by Merleau-Ponty, what defines man is not the capacity to create second nature, so another more complex umwelt, say of an economic, social, or cultural order beyond the biological nature, it is rather the capacity, capacity of going beyond created structures in order to create in order to create others. Okay, so now I will try to uh, uh, character provide a few characteristics of what I would like to call the dynamics of mind, and I will do this by uh, uh, juxtaposing them to the two characteristics I mentioned when I talked about the dynamics of life. So perspective and relation. We have a double shift from perspective to perspectivity and relation to rela relationality. And as I will try to show, this is the rudimentary conception of rationality. Okay, but in general, already from the words themselves, you see that we have a certain increase in generality. Okay, so let's start with the move or the shift from perspective to perspectivity. And here I would point out two different aspects. One is the multiplicity of perspective and the other is the mobility of perspective. So these are the characteristics of mind that differ from the characteristics of vitality, okay? When I will try to depict these two aspects, the multipl multiplicity and mobility of perspective, I will be drawing on Merleau-Ponty's and Plessner's reactions to Wolfgang Köhler's studies on the experiments of chimpanzees. You probably have heard of these studies. They were conducted in the, in the beginning of the 20th century. They are very famous. And in them, Köhler showed that basically the, the, the knowledge and insight and learning in chimpanzees is way different than behaviorists thought it was. But both Merleau-Ponty and Plessner were focusing particularly on those aspects in those experiments which, where chimpanzees fell short. So there were certain shortcuts that were present and they focused on this to try to get a glimpse into what could it be that, the, the, that differentiates the minded, say, body from merely a living body, although the, this is problematic, but okay. Um, so the first aspect is the so-called multiplicity of perspective. What does this mean? It is the ability to shift perspectives without losing the permanence or continuity. So what Kuller observed was the following. The chimpanzees who have learned to use a certain branch as a stick, okay, to, to get the bananas or what have you, were unable to do so if the another monkey was leaning against this particular branch. So all of a sudden they didn't see it as a stick, they saw it as something to be seated on. Or if this stick or this branch was still part of a dried bush, even though they could easily break it off, it was almost halfway broken off. So the point that Merleau-Ponty and Plessner bring out here is that with with the, the chimpanzees, what happens was is that there was a certain rigidity in their perception. So the meanings they saw were related to an overall concrete effective concept, context, and the meanings were lost in every transformation. Just like you have when you have a shake of a kaleidoscope, you get a new structure and the, the old, old one vanishes. So for the chimp, branch as a seat and branch as a stick were literally two things. But what happens uh, with, with human beings is, is that there is a temporal continuity or thickness across the change of these aspects. So aspects change, but there is a certain permanence or continuity. So what is seen is actually a branch, which was a seed that has become a stick. So you see two aspects of one thing and not two different things. So there's the, this element of the multiplicity of perspective. The second element that I would like to bring to the fore is the mobility of perspective. So the story doesn't end here. Uh, so not only is this perspective multiple, but it is also mobile, which means that for human beings, what is characteristic is the capacity to shift the center of perspective 
without changing their position, okay? What uh, Köhler noticed was something very interesting. If he taught a chimpanzee to, to acquire a banana that was behind a certain fence with, by means of a stink, the, the monkey could easily do so by simply, uh, if it only had to move the banana towards itself. However, if a small obstacle was introduced that was shaped like this, so that the uh, monkey had to push the banana away and around it, it was unable to do so. Now think about it from this perspective. If monkey or the chimpanzee was able to get to the banana itself, it would easily do, do so. It would have no problems getting from A to B. However, getting from B to A was an unsolvable problem for this monkey. And this seems strange for us, A to B is equals B to A. How is this possible? Why is this possible? Well, there is a certain asymmetry at work. And the main point that Merleau-Ponty is trying to make is that with the chimpanzee, the virtual center is its own body. Whereas with the human being, the virtual center is both its body and other things. So there is always uh, a, there is a certain characteristic eccentric positionality that is typical of, of the human being. This is how Plesner calls it. So, and, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the human being is able to inhabit other things which are now have this specific continuity and then also see its own body from this particular perspective. Now, both of these changes, both of these shifts are related to the, to the other shift that I mentioned, that is the shift from relations to relation, relationality, okay? Uh, and this has to do with a transformation in the structure of behavior. So this new type of relationality is actually what Merleau-Ponty refers to as symbolic behavior. And what to him is symbolic behavior is behavior where behavior itself becomes the proper theme of activity. Let me try to spell that out. When we talk about vital behavior, we said that what is crucial is relations. So the organism is embedded in its environment and it responds to specific relations. And these relations acquire a certain meaning only in the light of this relation between organism and Zumwelt, okay? What happens with symbolic behavior is that now behavior can become directed to these relations that become established between the organism and its Umwelt. So you have relations about relations, okay? So let me try to spell this out some more. Um, the human being is able to establish second order relations in regard to already established relations on the first order. I'm using the terms order ver here very cautiously, okay? And I will explain why. Between the lived body and its meaningful configurations. So I can do a certain behavioral act, for example, a certain gesture, a certain utterance, a certain drawing that expresses on a second level, a behavioral structure carried out on the first level. So when I actually move the banana away from me, what I do is something that is structurally similar that would do uh, what I would do if I went toward that banana with my body. So this movement expresses the meaning of the movement I would do if I went in that particular direction. So I can do a certain gesture that basically reverse, refers or expresses the other, uh, the other behavioral pattern. But this is very important. So this other behavioral uh, act expresses a behavioral structure on the first level, but by doing so, it not only expresses it, but also modifies it. Why? Because after this, this behavioral pattern that I'm able to do with my body is always permeated by the horizon of possibilities. So it kind of, it saps out some of the urgency of this embeddedness in my environment. If I am able, to use the behavior to refer to the vital behavior, all of a sudden this vital behavior becomes way more plastic and dynamic because I'm able to spread out and open up different vistas of acting. So there are always other possible ways to act and even to abstain from reaction altogether. And now given the fact that etymologically, both in Latin and Greek, the words for reason are ratio and logos, which re, uh, respectively denote uh, relation or relationship, this capacity to enter into this recursive structure of relation, relation, relationality is basically 
the basis or foundation or could be so claimed of the rationality in the broad sense of the term. Now, a brief qualification here. Unfortunately, because you know, I'm covering a lot of ground, I cannot go into two extremely important topics, maybe even essential topics, but that's all the more reason why I can't go into them, namely the intersubjectivity and especially the language. Everything I'm saying and explaining here does not happen in vacuum, of course, but is always embedded into a specific historical social uh, historic social cultural context. It is this particular context that teaches me how to uh, uh, different modes of handling with things, different modes of handling with objects, different modes of ver varying my responses and so on and so forth. And language here is especially important. Why so? Very briefly, because through various techniques such as writing, it can become sedimented. Okay, it can become sedimented. This means that it can be passed on and you basically enter into specific domains of meaning uh, uh, very easily. But even more import importantly, it is infinitively recursive. Why? I can use a certain sound, a certain word, a certain something to express the meaning of a certain structure, a certain behavioral structure. But once I do this, this expression becomes the structure I can then express with another verbal expression and again and again and again so there is this ongoing recursive recursivity which is extremely elegant extremely pliable and is the reason why as Merleau-Ponty puts it it is possible to speak about speech whereas it is impossible to paint about painting okay so uh, before I finalize let me just you know say a few more words about what how this relates to some of the topics that we were talking about before. So if we talked about polarity and radiation with regards to life, uh, with regards to mind, I would like to talk about hiatus and projection. And I will sh make this somewhat shorter because I'm running out of time. So with regards to hiatus, okay? With regards to hiatus, um, this is something that, uh, um, uh, in, in, in the dynamics of life was referred to by polarity. We still have the same structure, so the same dynamic autonomy uh, and dynamic unity. Uh, only this time, the new unity, as mentioned, takes up and transforms the logics of life. So we get a new structuration, a new gestalt with a new quality. Another important feature, a crucial feature, is that we don't have only a virtual center but, and a normative center, but we have an eccentric center, okay? Eccentric and metanormative center. What does this mean? That the center of the human being is always posi positioned askew or a slant with regards to its actual corporeal self and its environment, okay? So the meaningful structures that the human being is confronted with are always surrounded by a halo of possible restructurations of different and alternate modes of acting and seeing. And these alternative possibilities, mind you, are not given as actualities. They are not clear representations, but they are similar to what you have when you have a, a, a figure on a background. The ground is given to you in an indeterminate way, the same way these possibilities are given to you. But because they're always present, you're always decentered. You're always eccentric, as, as Plessner would put it. And because of this, um, you don't have normativity, but metanormativity, which means that you are able to shift between various normative uh, frameworks. So not only do you establish a specific normative framework, life as polarity, but you're able to shift between them. Again, this does not happen haphazardly on the one hand, nor does it happen in a predetermined way, but is again something that needs to be actualized. It is given as a possibility, not as an actuality. And this is what I would like to refer to as a minded body, okay? The minded body is the body that is capable of cultivating this hiatus or pause. It has the possibility to stand outside, to stand above, to withdraw and not react. And it, at its ultimate boundary, it is what enables the subject-object relationship, but is not reducible to it. So it is a broader concept than this. The minded body is a broader concept. Uh, and we can maybe touch upon this uh, in the discussion. So, but instead of um, radiation, there is projection. So with, with the human being, what enters the stage is the surplus of negativity. I love this phrase, it is by Plessner. 
This means that every actual affirmation, so everything I posit, everything I posit is always subtended by a possible negation, by a possible disruption. So my R's, my R's are always constitutively surrounded by R nots or could be's. Okay, so a cup is never exhaustively a cup. It can also be a weapon. It can also be a paperweight and so on and so forth. And I myself am never exclusively a coffee lover, a professor or something else entirely. But I am those things precisely because of this structure, because it enables the meanings to arise in the way that they arrive. So the thickness of each biological significance has to bleed out, so to speak, in order for the thickness of the object to assert itself. So Instead of centers of attraction and resistance that we find in the, in the realm of the living, what we have here are objects, which are literally what stands against the Gegenstand in German. So no more Widerstand, but Gegenstand. Uh, and we have, instead of a virtual uh, environment, a hyper-virtual environment, which is basically uh, the capacity of the human being to project the symbolic domains, domains of myth, of, uh, uh, of religion, of mathematics, of history, and so on and so forth uh, uh, around itself. But these symbolic domains are again, always surrounded by a horizon of possibility. So there is this moment of negation and at the very ultimate horizon, this then feeds into the, 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 the worldness, objectivity, truth, and so on and so forth. Um, so maybe just one quote before I wrap this up. Uh, it's by Merleau-Ponty from The Structure of Behavior. He says the following, the human dialectic is ambiguous. It, it is first manifested by the social or cultural structures, the appearance of which it brings about and in which it imprisons itself. So these are the symbol symbolic the environments in which we live. We live in these uh, social and cultural structures and we are imprisoned in them, so to speak. We are embedded to the to, to such a degree that we normally don't even notice them in our everyday engagements with the world. But its use objects, its cultural objects, would not be what they are if the activity which brings about their appearance did not, did not also have as its meaning to reject them and to surpass them. So there is always this halo or, or surplus of negativity uh, uh, surrounding these specific cultural objects. So this would be the sum. And now in conclusion, so, okay, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. I've uh, touched upon many very different things, used wacky terminology in doing so. So what I would like to, you know, kind of uh, summarize this with and what might be of interest for discussion. You might have noticed that when I was talking about the relationship between mind and life, and also we could say about life and matter, is uh, something that is, um, some, some version of a transformativism and not additivism. So mind is not life plus something, life is not matter plus something. You always have these transformations that occur. So there is this umgestaltung present. And I find this idea intriguing and it need of further philosophical elaboration. And Merleau-Ponty in phenomenology of perception tries to do so through the notion of founding, which he, th which he takes from Husserl, uh, which is precisely an attempt to spell out this dialectical relationship between the, the, say, parts and the whole. Then another important thing is the question of quantitative continuity and qualitative, qualitative discontinuity. So you might have a certain phenomenon that is quantitatively quantitatively continues with something else, yet at a certain at a certain point embodies or enact a certain qualitatively distinct mode of behavior or being. So this is another thing that needs to be spelled out. And Plessner talks, says that we need to develop a theory or even axiomatic theory of organic models. So these models are uh, these notions that uh, are qualitatively irreducible to something else. Otherwise, you simply lose the significance of what you're talking about. The third thing is this relationship between embodied mind and minded body. There's been a lot of emphasis on embodied part and rightly so, because it would seem that after the early modern ages, there's been a progressive drift towards the in, uh, angelic intellect extreme. However, I fear that some of the tendencies might be going too far where, you know, mind, reason, language, concepts, and so on and so forth have become terms of derision. And I have issues with that 
because it seems to me that it's something really important in the notion of the minded body and the mind as a unique structuration of the corporeal existence. So this feeds directly into the fourth point, which is what the attempt of this talk was, was also reclaiming the mind. So there is the plop, there's the difference between saying that mind is not some sort of a calculus. So the specific conception that was developed through the Cartesian uh, distinction, and then simply equating this with all understandings or uses of the mind. In the past, uh, so when, we, when people talk about the Western tradition, they say it's very logocentric. And what they do is then they take this logos and simply equate it with the notion of the logos that was developed in the Cartesian tradition. But there is a different, more broader conception of the mind that can be and needs to be spelled out and needs to be developed. Uh, and for example, when you read people like Plato, when you read people like Plotinus, when you read St. Augustine, even if you go and read mystics like Meister Eckhart, they all talk about mind, they all talk about logos. Is this the same logos that Descartes is talking about? Definitely not. This is something that needs to be reclaimed. And finally, about, so the answer to the question of the reflexive scientist or reflexive biologist, uh, there's a notion of uroboric, uroboric reflection that I think could be spelled out um, further. And it's closely related what Conguiem calls reasonable rationalism, Merleau-Ponty calls radical reflection. So I will end on this note by two quotes. Reasonable rationalism says that the scientist has to be able to incorporate the conditions of its practice by recognizing the originality of life and therefore a knowledge that thought of the living ultimately takes from living the idea of the living. And when Merleau-Ponty talks about radical reflection, or as he sometimes calls it, hyper-reflection, this is the type of reflection that knows itself as reflection on an unreflective experience and that elucidates the unreflective view which it supersedes and shows the possibility of this latter in order to comprehend itself as a beginning. So Uroboric thought is a thought which knows that it stems from the unreflective uh, 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 experience, takes it up, transforms it, in doing so sediments it in precisely that experience and thereby opens up uh, open, opens up new vistas for further reflection and investigation. Okay, so this is where I finally stop. <laughs>